and prayer to recognize the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, this Premier has the worst job creation record in the country. 6,000 jobs lost last month. People are struggling, but this tired and out-of-touch government refuses to listen. In fact, they're making things worse. Mr. Speaker, it's time for a change, and it's past time for that government to offer some relief to the people of this province. Why won't the Premier cut the fuel tax for six months and offer Saskatchewan people the break that they so desperately deserve? Recognize the Premier. The data that I have, um, just Statistics Canada data, says that there was 10,500 jobs. That, well, Statistics Canada, Mr. Speaker, does uh, put out what the job numbers were in Saskatchewan year over year, and it was 10,500 this past year. Right. What that has done has, has attracted has attracted about 30,000 people to the province of Saskatchewan to make a community in Saskatchewan their home over the course of just the last year, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, is that we are growing, whether it be jobs or population, at a rate that we have not seen since 1914 in this province, Mr. Speaker. That is the record of Saskatchewan uh, today, Mr. Speaker. And if, if the Leader of the Opposition is so certain as to that it is time for a change, we should portray what that change actually looks like, Mr. Speaker. Because right now, today, in BC, Mr. Speaker, their gas tax is 27 cents a litre. Under NDP BC, Mr. Speaker, their gas tax is 27 cents a litre. And that change involves running an $8 billion deficit and being downgraded twice just this past week. Yeah. Yeah. Recognize the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, not only is that Premier failing to deliver when it comes to the cost of living, they're failing to deliver when it comes to health care in That's this right. province. Mr. Speaker, today in your gallery, we're joined by Caitlin and Jordy Soren. Their two-year-old two daughter, Mr. Speaker, needs specialized care at the Children's Hospital from a pediatric gastroenterologist. But as we've canvassed many times, Mr. Speaker, in this assembly, the Children's Hospital still doesn't have a pediatric GI. And this family has been forced to go to Toronto for the care that their daughter needs. Does the Premier, does the Premier think it's at all acceptable for Caitlin and Jordy to be forced to travel thousands of miles just to get the care that they need for their daughter? Recognize the Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, welcome Caitlin and Jordy to, uh, to their assembly here today, and I would be uh, pleased to meet with them after the uh, proceedings of this afternoon, uh, if they so choose. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we know that we have uh, some gaps to fill at the Children's Hospital in Saskatoon. Uh, there is uh, additional funding in this year's budget uh, on top of last year's uh, funding to develop a comprehensive pediatric gastroenterology program at the Jim Patterson's Children's uh, Hospital. Uh, there is recruitment that is uh, underway for the vacancies that we have at the JP. PCH uh, right now, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we had a bit of a discussion uh, last night in health estimates about uh, this, amongst uh, several other issues. Uh, we have asked that the SHA, as well as, as the Saskatchewan Health Recruitment Agency, that they make this a priority, and it has been a priority for them to fill those vacancies. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's my understanding that the SHA uh, is in the process of finalizing a contract uh, with two candidates, uh, and we'll have uh, more information uh, to share on that in the near future. But I would just uh, reiterate that uh, we are doing everything we can to fill these vacancies, Mr. Speaker. Recognize the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, this is a failure of leadership, and that responsibility rests with the Premier right. of this province. Right. This family is watching their daughter in pain with her condition worsening. Now, they did have a pediatric GI here in Saskatchewan, but when that doctor left, they were forced to go out of the province, all the way to Toronto. Now, Mr. Speaker, they are not the first family to be forced to leave the province to get a GI specialist for their young one, but Mr. Speaker, they should be the last. Will the minister meet with the family and will he make sure, more importantly, that we have the specialists that we need in this province to tend to sick kids? Recognize the Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said in my, uh, at the beginning of my previous answer, yes, I would uh, gladly meet with the family here uh, this afternoon. We'll sit down in, in my office and, uh, and have a, a discussion about uh, their personal circumstances, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd be happy uh, to do that uh, uh, today. As I said uh, previously, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, we are working uh, through the SHA and through the Health Recruitment Agency uh, to fill those vacancies at the Jim Pattison Children's Hospital. I would say that uh, the vast majority of positions are, are filled at the JPCH. Uh, we do need to fill these vacancies when it comes to pediatric gastroenterology. Um, it is a highly sought after a specialty, not just here in, in Saskatchewan, but obviously at the hospitals right across this country, uh, making sure that we are uh, training, and that's not just us here in Saskatchewan, but other provinces and territories as well, uh, training, uh, recruiting, and retaining uh, healthcare specialists, and particularly those when it comes to, to children's health. It's a priority for us, for government, and we're going to ensure that we do everything we can to get those vacancies filled as quickly as possible, Mr. Speaker. Here, here, here. Recognize the leader of the opposition. Speaker, to state it clearly, these are not just their personal circumstances. This is the case for every family in the province exactly. whose child needs a GI specialist. Now, this is a party that loves to talk about opening buildings, whether it's the Children's Hospital or the Urgent Care Centre. But, Mr. Speaker, predictably, they're clapping for themselves while they fail to staff those facilities. know that buildings do not provide health care to Saskatchewan people. Health care workers do. And when we don't have health care workers like GI specialists, families like Caitlin and Jordy's are forced to pay out of pocket to go to Toronto to get care that should be available here at home. At home. Mr. Speaker, this is a rich province. We should be able to take care of our kids at home. Does the Premier accept any responsibility for the SAS Party's failure to keep staff in this province? Yeah. Recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, we, we have some uh, outstanding staff, uh, specialists, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, anesthesiologists, uh, teams right across this province uh, that are providing a very excellent care for the people of, of Saskatchewan. And it uh, is disappointing, Mr. Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition would not recognize the great work by, uh, being done by these teams, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's significant progress being taken. Mr. Speaker, uh, we are making... Mr. Speaker, we are making a significant progress and, and continue to make progress, recognizing, of course, that we do have vacancies to fill, as do other uh, provincial health care systems as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just as an example, in 2023, we had eight new anesthesiologists beginning uh, work in Saskatchewan, uh, with 10 more scheduled to begin their practice in 2024. That's in the area of anesthesiology. More work to do, Mr. Speaker, but we are seeing significant progress when it comes to recruiting specialists, Mr. Speaker. Recognize a member from Regina Walsh Acres. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Caitlin and Jordy decided to come to the legislature after waiting for months, months of writing letters to the government and to this minister. They've exhausted all avenues so that their two-year-old daughter could access the care that she so desperately needs. People shouldn't have to fight this hard for care, especially for a child, Mr. Speaker. And they shouldn't... And they shouldn't have to travel two provinces away for it either. Does the minister think it is acceptable that this family, or any family for that matter, has to travel two provinces away for care that should be available here in this province? Recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I believe that uh, my office has been working on casework uh, uh, with this particular family. And again, uh, I will meet with them after the proceedings here uh, today uh, to have a further uh, conversation uh, with them, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to the members, a uh, question. I, I would say that we are trying to provide as many services as we can here in Saskatchewan so that they are close to home for patients and for, for children, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when we uh, opened the uh, Jim Pattison Children's Hospital a number of years ago, uh, this was a significant project for this government, and one that we are proud to support, along with the fundraising efforts of the foundation in the city of Saskatoon that uh, raises significant dollars for this uh, for this particular uh, project, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Children's Hospital saw an increase of 22 beds, specifically for mothers and children in Saskatoon. We've increased the number of pediatric inpatient beds as well from 37 to 45. As I said previously, we are working to fill uh, the remaining vacancies that currently exist when it comes to doctors and specialists at the Children's Hospital. Yeah. 
Recognize the member from Regina Wall Shakers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If everything was going great for this family and their, the, the care that their daughter was getting, they wouldn't be here at the legislature today. But this isn't just about pediatric gastroenterologists that this government can't retain. According to SAS docs and confirmed at committee last night, there are 15 pediatric vacancies for specialists working with the Children's Hospital. Mr. Speaker, we have vacancies across the board in pediatrics. Pediatric cardiology, pediatric emergency room specialists, pediatric respirology, pediatric neurology, and the list goes on. To the minister, how many other families are forced to travel out of our province due to this government's failure to recruit and retain pediatric specialists? Recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have taken a number of steps to, to work to fill those vacancies through uh, the establishment of the Health Recruitment Agency, through additional training programs, through the creation of uh, new incentives as well to make sure that we are offering the most competitive uh, compensation that we can for, for specialists that are in very highly sought after uh, specialties, Mr. Speaker, right across uh, this, this country. They are in demand. Uh, in reference to the numbers that the member opposite uh, raised in his question and that we discussed last night, I, I stand to be corrected, I'm going from memory here, but I believe of, of the numbers that, that he mentioned, I think about six of those, uh, uh, six, six and a half of those FTEs are actually currently the process of, of being filled, and uh, we have candidates that are, are set to, uh, to sign contracts and to take those positions, and the remaining 4.5 FTEs uh, progress is underway uh, to get those individuals hired as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recognize the member from Regina Walshakers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fifteen vacancies for pediatric specialists working at the Children's Hospital out of how many? According to the government's own numbers back in 2016, they plan to have 52 pediatric specialists working at the Children's Hospital. If there are currently 15 vacancies, Mr. Speaker, that's a vacancy rate of 29%. Nearly a quarter of physicians meant to provide adequate and accessible care to children in the province are vacant. Minister, or to the minister, does the minister really believe that his recruitment and retention plan is working when 15 positions are currently still vacant. Recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as I, I stated previously, this is a, uh, a priority for our government. The, the Children's Hospital itself is a priority for our government, something that was very important for uh, this government, previous health ministers, previous uh, members sitting around the cabinet and the caucus table to ensure that we uh, did have and would create a Children's Hospital in Saskatchewan, like so many other provinces uh, do have. We are proud of this uh, facility, Mr. Speaker, that did not exist uh, prior to uh, us having the opportunity to serve in government, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I would say that none of these positions would have existed prior prior to, to that, Mr. Speaker. Um, we are making significant investments into children's health care in, in Saskatchewan. In 24-25, we're making over $2.2 million in investments to improve health care access for Saskatchewan's children and youth patients. As I said before, we recognize that we have uh, some vacancies to, to fill at the Children's Hospital. We're committed to working with our partners to get the people that we need to fill those spots so that we can provide care to children here in our province, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Recognize a member from Regina Elphinstone Centre. Mr. Speaker, the sad truth that this tired is that this tired and out-of-touch government is failing the needs of patients both young and old. Saskatchewan has the worst wait times in Canada for knee and hip replacement surgeries. That represents so many people in pain. And this isn't some big reveal, Mr. Speaker. Saskatchewan has held that record for five straight years, notwithstanding how many patients that minister has sent to private clinics in Calgary. Will the minister admit his surgical solution isn't working, or will he renew the contract with this private SAS party donor in Calgary? Recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The uh, current average wait time for hip replacements in Saskatchewan is now 176 days, which is uh, significantly lower than the uh, time reported by Kai High of 232 days and uh, lower than our pre-pandemic wait times of 189 days. 
Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, I detailed some of these numbers yesterday, and I think we probably talked about it in estimates last night. Um, we are on track to complete the most orthopedic surgeries in the province's history. We've already completed the most knee replacement surgeries in this province's history at 3,700 uh, knee surgeries being uh, completed. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have, in the first three quarters of uh, the previous uh, fiscal year, our government has done over 2,000 more knee replacement surgeries that were done in the entire fiscal year of 2006-2007. We do have more work to do, Mr. Speaker. We're supporting our surgical teams in this province with record funding investments or record investments of funding uh, into the surgical program. And we're going to continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Recognize the member from the John Alphonstone Centre. Mr. Speaker, a lot, a lot of spin, a lot of numbers there. Worst in the nation. I didn't hear the health minister challenge that fact right. because he cannot. Mr. Speaker, the private surgery scheme is a fantastic deal, not for patients and not for Saskatchewan taxpayers, but it's great for that private surgery clinic and for that SAS party government. Mr. Speaker, that private clinic has donated over $14,000 to the SAS party, and what did they get, Mr. Speaker? They got a six million dollar sole source contract for hip and knee surgeries. Will the minister keep helping out his political donors or will he actually seek out solutions to the surgical crisis? Recognize the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, this government has been seeking out solutions uh, to make sure that we're in increasing capacity when it comes to getting surgeries done uh, in this province and uh, when necessary, uh, with partnerships such as the one we have currently in, uh, in Calgary, with the Canadian Surgical Solutions to accommodate up to 250 publicly funded joint replacement surgeries for eligible Saskatchewan patients. Uh, I'm not going to read the quote again, Mr. Speaker, but the members opposite, they could pull a pantser from yesterday and, and, and read the quote that I gave from one of the patients, a health care worker, Mr. Speaker, who said that this is a good initiative and she was very appreciative of that, of that option, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as I've said previously, there are $3.5 million more invested into the surgical program this year over last year, and that is a record amount. It builds on previous years, Mr. Speaker. We continue to invest more money into our surgical programs, Mr. Speaker, to get more surgeries done, to get the wait list cut down, and we're going to support our surgical teams, Mr. Speaker, unlike the members opposite. Yeah. Recognize the member from the John Alpha Stone Centre. Five years of failure, Mr. Speaker. Five years of last place. Surely we can do better than that. Right. Yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, the minister was fairly sure that there must have been a competitive selection process to choose uh, the surgery provider for this sole source contract. Probably, he thinks, Mr. Speaker. But our job is not to give that minister the benefit of the doubt. So. Will he commit to tabling documentation detailing the ministry's selection process for picking that exclusive provider of hip and knee surgeries, and when will we get it? Recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this was done through a request for proposals, an RFP an open, transparent process that, that uh, we would use um, to, to do this. It, not, not, not a secret, Mr. Speaker, and it's done uh, according to uh, how, these, uh, how these sorts of initiatives should be uh, implemented, uh, Mr. Speaker. We do know that the, the NDP would, uh, would scrap any sort of uh, initiative like this when it comes to publicly funded, privately operated uh, uh, surgeries uh, and other, uh, provide, uh, other types of services, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, again, uh, we are making uh, record investments into our surgical program uh, in this province and doing more surgeries, and I detailed some of the numbers earlier, but more surgeries, for example, in the areas of hips and knees uh, than were done in the, final, the entire final year of the NDP government's uh, time in, in, in government back in 2006-2007, Mr. Speaker. Recognize the member from the John Alfred Souls Centre. Mr. Speaker, if the minister needs any assistance with providing documents for that selection process, which I think we heard him commit to providing, I'm sure he can ask Kevin Doherty. Kevin Doherty is a former SAS Party MLA for Regina Northeast, Minister of Finance and Minister of Advanced Education, and the man who lobbied on behalf of Surgical Solutions himself. According to the Registrar of Lobbyists, he had informal communications, written communications, meetings, phone calls, and presentations with the Premier and minister and senior staff on behalf of that private clinic in Calgary that won the $6 million sole source, sole source contract. So while he's at it, will the minister commit to tabling any documentation about communication with his former colleague and lobbyist, Kevin Doherty, on this sweetheart deal with their donor? Her. 
can ask the Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, my understanding that uh, Mr. Doherty did not lobby on this, was not involved in this particular uh, RFP, uh, Mr. Speaker. So that's that's what I've uh, been informed of, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Just make uh, again, um, you know, we have to be we have to be cautious when we hear from the member for where's she from? Elphinstone, Regina Elphinstone. The member for Regina Elphinstone um, who puts a lot puts a lot of things on the record, Mr. Speaker, uh, disparaging our health care system, disparaging health care workers, Mr. Speaker. Um, calling, uh, for example, I remind the members opposite that uh, she called the uh, the breast health centre announcement a flashy announcement or something to that effect, Mr. Wow. Speaker, minimizing uh, the impact of that particular uh, investment, Mr. Speaker. So, and, and now she says, how dare I, Mr. Speaker, for the yeah. record. So um, let's, let's, let's remember, Mr. Speaker, let's remember the, the source of these comments, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. You recognize the member from Saskatoon Eastview. Mr. Speaker, on April 5th, the Minister of Education sent a letter directly to trustees asking them to publicly join him in his attack on teachers in our province. Quote, I would encourage you and your boards to consider how you can best communicate with your constituents about these realities and the teachers' union's demands on your local school division and school communities. The implications are not insignificant, and your voice as the local school board is needed. Three days later, a board chair, who was a nominated candidate for the SAS party, signed a memo that was forwarded directly to teachers a memo that was parroting many of the SAS party lines. Is this what respecting local school board autonomy and good faith bargaining looks like under this tired and out of touch government? Recognize the Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would remind the member opposite that if he wants to throw rocks, the president of their own party is also a school trustee in this province, and school trustees in this province come from a wide variety of political backgrounds, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my letter last week to school board trustees was a reminder to them that the discussion that we're engaged in right now in the public around this bargaining situation that we're in, Mr. Speaker, is really a discussion around the role of local governance in education in the province of Saskatchewan, Mr. Speaker. We have school trustees and school board chairs, Mr. Speaker, that are elected by their constituents and communities all across the province, Mr. Speaker. They have an important role to play in terms of how their communities have a voice in what education is delivered in their local communities and in their schools, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was encouraging trustees to use their local voice and stand up for local voice against an unelected teachers union leadership. Thank you. Recognize a member from Saskatoon Eastview. Mr. Speaker, I think it's telling. I think it's certainly telling that as far as I know, only one school board has taken up that minister's offer to weigh in, and that board is chaired by a SAS party candidate. School boards need to be fully independent to make their own decisions, not intimidated through cryptic threats and letters addressed directly to trustees by that minister. In his memo, the minister also said, quote, trustees must continue to be diligent in ensuring the importance of local governance remains intact after this collective bargaining agreement and beyond. How is that anything but a veiled threat to the existence of boards in Saskatchewan? Recognize the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, I'd, let, I'd actually like to thank the Saskatchewan River's Public School Division for putting out a memo to folks in their community to communicate their board's position on our local bargaining situation, Mr. Speaker. I would remind the member opposite and all members of this House, Mr. Speaker, that actually also on that board in Saskatchewan Rivers is the president of the Saskatchewan School Boards Association, who is elected by her peers to represent all 27 public Catholic and Francophone boards around the province, Mr. Speaker. School board trustees, about 240 of them around the province from communities that we all represent, Mr. Speaker, have an important voice, Mr. Speaker, a local voice in how education is delivered, Mr. Speaker. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that our local trustees are the ones who should be making these decisions, not in union leadership, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Recognize the member from Saskatoon, New Washington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last week, Prairie Harm Reduction announced that due to capacity and funding challenges, they were forced to reduce their hours. 
This reduction in services will mean that hundreds of people will go without life-saving supports they need when they need it. This decision is directly related to this government's inability to provide wrap-around supports for people with addictions, and it will cost lives. In the Executive Director of Prairie Harm Reduction's own words, I quote, when the safe consumption site is closed, nobody's going to be there. And that's really a scary thing to try to come to terms with. Mr. Speaker, does the minister really believe that we can save lives when organizations like Prairie Harm Reduction are forced to deny people evidence-based life-saving services? Here, here. Here, here. Recognize the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said uh, earlier this week when the member raised the Prairie Harm Reduction, our government funds Prairie Harm Reduction in the amount of $2.2 million a year, Mr. Speaker. Those funds are going to efforts to address uh, needs in the community, Mr. Speaker. No, they do not go to drug consumption sites because the message that our government is sending to the communities and to the people battling addiction is that there is no safe use of an illicit drug, Mr. Speaker. We are adding addiction treatment spaces and making it easier for individuals to access those spaces, Mr. Speaker, and that is saving lives. It's healing families and it's strengthening communities across Saskatchewan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah.